Michael Lynch, thank you for joining us on Think Tech. Pleasure to be here. So you are the uh, you are a, an MD, PhD researcher. Uh, that is correct. Uh, both of them. Um, I mostly do research currently in the uh, chemical engineering science, so on our renewable platform to produce uh, chemicals and fuels from renewable biomass feedstocks. So, uh, so but, but, but you're an MD trained researcher person. Yes. So what in, what in, in the MD training helps you to do fuels? Uh, I think just the critical thinking training. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. I, I'll, I'll accept that completely. <laughs> so OPX Bio is your company. You're the chief executive officer and the founder, undoubtedly. Uh, chief scientific officer and one of the founders, yes. Okay, okay. One of the founders. And where is this located? It's in uh, Boulder, Colorado. Boulder, oh, it's a good place. Yes, it's a very nice it, place. It's a great place for you. Know, <laughs> no. Okay, and you're here. You're here especially at the Hilton Hawaiian Village for this bio conference. Tell us about the conference. Conference is the um, BIO, so the Bio Industrial Organization, uh, Pacific Rim Conference. And it's focused on uh, renewable fuels and renewable chemicals this year. Oh, okay. This is, is this an extension of the, the Industrial Bio Conference? It, it is, yes. Okay. Well, I mean, that's been happening for a couple of years now. This yes. is not the first time. Mm -hmm. How, what kind of a crowd is showing up for this? It's actually uh, a pretty well-attended event this year. Um, especially since it's in Hawaii. I mean, I've been to it several times in Vancouver the last time. Um, and it tends to be made up of some venture capitalists, um, policymakers, um, people in startup businesses, um, larger chemical companies, fuel companies, trying to make connections. Including some and, big capital. Yes. So why do you go? I mean, well, let me put it this way. You go as a speaker. That's why you go. Yes. And you were on, you were on these panels, and that's the way you, you've been participating in these conferences? Uh, yes, so you either can go and you can uh, speak, um, you can give a poster, or you can uh, just go to listen and make connections. But it's better to Yeah, it's definitely speak. better to Then speak. you can make an entrance, too. <laughs> you can definitely make an entrance, yeah. I think we, we definitely go, um, um, I'm actually lucky enough to take uh, uh, my colleagues part in this conference, so actually our, our VP of Business Development, Mike Rosenberg, mm -hmm. was originally scheduled to attend, and uh, due to um, work he has to accomplish, I was lucky enough to take his place. Foolish fellow. He exactly. should have come. <laughs> gave you the opportunity now. So what did you speak about? I spoke about um, OPX Bio's uh, first product that's entering commercialization and scale-up, which is bioacrylic. Okay. So what was the panel that you were on? It was uh, renewable chemicals and metabolic engineering. So this goes beyond, you know, the old renewable fuel issue, which everybody always talks about increasingly in this world. Everybody everywhere talks about renewable fuel. This isn't renewable fuel at all. No, this is not renewable fuel. This is renewable chemicals. Why do we need renewable chemicals? Because we want to wean ourselves off um, uh, off oil chemicals? Well, <laughs> there, there are numerous reasons. <laughs> okay. Um, I think uh, um, one is to replace uh, petroleum-derived feedstocks, so um, partly to wean ourselves off of the petroleum. So the chemicals in particular, the acrylic that we are making, is a direct replacement of an acrylic made from propylene, which is derived from petroleum. Mm -hmm. um, we can reduce uh, CO2 in a comparable um, amount derived from petroleum by over 75%, so a good environmental impact as well as the security impact. And we actually, our, our business strategy and model is that we're going to do that uh, with a cost equivalence to petroleum. So that it actually is the same product. It's another way of saying it costs the same thing. Yeah, costs the same thing, is the same product, but made with renewable. But if, fuel goes, if, if oil goes up to $150 a barrel, which it seems to be going again, mm -hmm. um, then you'll look better. Yeah, definitely. Because you'll be stable in your price. Well, I mean, sugar has its own, uh, sugar feedstocks have their own cycles and up and down. Um, but yes, the, the higher the, the cost of a barrel of crude oil, the better um, our cost advantage is. Oh, sugar beets, let me seize on that. <laughs> That's the secret, huh? That's the secret <laughs> sauce, sugar beets? Yeah, currently we're planning to make our acrylic with either dextrose or sucrose. And we can use either, uh, so it's corn syrup or cane sugar or beet sugar. But we also have secondary products um, and secondary uh, um, projects that would utilize um, a wider array of feedstocks, which can be converted to hydrogen and CO2. So actually, we recently have been funded from the Department of Energy and ARPA-E program to work on the conversion of renewable hydrogen and CO2 into uh, fatty acids and uh, biodiesel. That's fuel. That is fuel. That's not acrylic. That is not acrylic. That so is you're fuel. doing more than just acrylic. We're doing more than just acrylic. Acrylic is our first product. Okay, so it looks like, you know, once you get involved in, you know, in 
in finding a replacement for oil, everybody wants you. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, yes. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so uh, how does how does that work? I mean, for example, if I if I make uh, acrylic with if I make acrylic with uh, sugar beets, uh, w w will is my acrylic edible? Will it be tasty? Will will it be? A, can I use it as a dessert uh, on my menu? <laughs> well, you, you probably could try, but I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, no, acrylic currently is used in a lot of consumer products. So um, a large portion of the acrylic made today is actually polymerized into products. Um, so super absorbent polymers that go into things like diapers, um, which is a big end use application for acrylic. Um, acrylic is also um, combined with other um, chemicals to form the basis of paints. So um, you've probably heard about acrylic paint. Um, and those are the, so the coatings, paints, and, and polymers are really the biggest end use applications for acrylic. Acrylic is a big thing in, in, in society these days. Yes. I mean, if I went down to Lowe's or uh, uh, Home Depot, I'd probably find a lot of products with acrylic in it. Yeah, you wouldn't. Mm -hmm. There's over 8 billion pounds of acrylic uh, in the marketplace yearly. Yeah, so, okay, so now what's, you don't have to tell us any intellectual property secrets here. Okay. Uh, although if you did, it'd be all right. You know, <laughs> cheer up, it's on tape. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but in general, how do you convert uh, sugar beets to acrylic? Okay, so we actually have a platform at OPX that allows us to rapidly um, optimize microorganisms that would convert the sugar that we feed them into um, acrylic or acrylic precursors. So it starts with the sugar, and then it goes to microorganisms. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the microorganisms. You can identify them here on ThinkTech, can't you? Uh, currently, we use um, genetically mod modified bacteria for our acrylic process. Do they, will they eat my hand if I put them on my hand? No, no. Okay. Just, so. These are bacteria that are used um, currently to produce things like insulin and other usable use products. So they're already in use. They're already in, in use, in, yeah. in chemical situations and medical situations. Yeah, that is correct. Okay, so I feed the sugar to the micro, the, my, to these bacteria, mm -hmm. and what do they do with it? They basically take it up, and they have enzymes in there that we um, work with to optimize that convert the sugar molecules into um, the acrylic molecules. Uh, okay, and then... And then the acrylic comes out of the organism in a big uh, uh, mixing tank, and we take the uh, acrylic out of the tank and purify it. Okay, so the question is how big is the tank? Because we need to do this on a commercial basis. Mm -hmm. We want to fill uh, Office Depot, or rather Home Depot up. We need a lot, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's true. So how do you? How big is the tank? So our first uh, commercial plant, we're aiming to make about 100 million pounds of acrylic per year. That'll fill a uh, Home Depot up. That'll fill a Home Depot up, yes. And uh, the tanks are pretty large, hundreds of thousands of gallons. So you you put you put the bacteria and the sugar in the tank, and like wine, this whole thing will sort of ferments into acrylic. That is true. It's very much like the beer or the wine process, just a lot bigger tanks. Stainless. Sta well, stainless. Yeah. You, you want to avoid contamination. Yeah. You get a pure mm -hmm. product. Exactly. So what does it look like when the, when the, when the little bacteria are finished with it? Well, it, it looks like most any other bacterial culture. So the, the, uh, the solution that comes out of that actually uh, is pretty clear. Mm -hmm. um, and we just separate the water away from the acrylic, and there we go. Okay, how do you separate the water? Well, there's a whole set of downstream operations that we use. So um, currently, it gets into a little of the uh, secret sauce that uh, we have. Well, I tell you, <laughs> see, that's my, my, but, my uh, job is to, is to get right up to that yeah, level, exactly. you know. So we, we I do, want you uh, to say, no, I can't yeah, tell we do, you that. We do pretty traditional um, uh, bioprocessing technologies to do the separations. So, I mean, we can centrifuge out the, uh, the cell mass. Mm -hmm. And actually, the intermediate that we make that we convert to acrylic is called 3-HP, or 3-hydroxypropionic acid. Mm -hmm. So it's one chemical step away from acrylic. So the uh, microbes actually make the 3-HP. And then we actually separate the 3-HP and convert the 3-HP chemically by traditional chemical processes to acrylic. So we have traditional um, dehydration catalysts and columns and um, uh, very chemical process looking back end. Okay, so what happens to the beets or the sugar that you put in? What, what's the end of the story when you're, when you're separating the water out? What, where did they go? Uh, so the, sh disappear? the sugars are all gone by then. They're all gone. They're all converted to the product. Okay, and here's my more pointed question. What happens to the bacteria? Yes. Where do they go? So actually you know, it's bacteria a... have rights too, you know. <laughs> Unfortunately, they're all dead. <laughs> so uh, we do, we do uh, are very careful with uh, the, the waste treatment coming from the plant. So mm -hmm. um, we have holding tanks that actually um, kill and heat up the bacteria to make sure that we have um, 
killing, and then you, we had you to don't, do you don't reuse disposal. them. I mean, you can't, like, or you or you have colonies where you, you know, you draw more bacteria off your stash yeah. of bacteria. Yeah, so we would have a master stock that we would actually keep drawing new bacteria off of to okay. start the new process over. Um, we don't reuse the bacteria that are in the the large tanks. Okay, why? It wouldn't be effective. It wouldn't be effective. Yeah, they've kind of served their purpose at that point and are yeah. are pretty much done. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, yeah. I, I I don't think they have rights to actually. <laughs> protest over that. <laughs> Some people might feel that well, way. They, they may, know. yeah. <laughs> so how long does this process take by the time you get to the actual acrylic? So um, when right now we're, we're modeling our, our performance on a 50-hour fermentation time. Oh, that's not much. So it's not much. So you actually will have the bacteria start, and in 50 hours they're done doing their, their job. You have the product, and then the separation starts. So you have already designed the process we're talking about. This process, has, you've had proof of concept on this yes, process. Yes, that is correct. Yeah. That's pretty terrific. How long yeah. have you been working on it? So we have been working on acrylic for the last few years. Uh, we're, um, we were founded in the middle of 2007. Um, and we are planning in the next year to be going to a demonstration scale facility, which is about 50,000 liters in terms of fermentation volume. So the next stage scale. up. Yeah. Okay, so that... So let's let's talk for a minute about how your capital follows your appetite. <laughs> <laughs> you started out as a, just a classic startup, right? Small in the garage mm -hmm. or something like that. Not not a garage, but yes, very small. Close, yeah. So okay. uh, we we started um, with the platform, which allows us to change these microbes, and really had to spend a lot of time thinking about which markets do we want to go after. And, and acrylic is a very good market, and technically we could do it as well. And so we had a, a seed round of funding in which is a million dollars from our uh, Bay Area firm called Exceed Capital. Mm -hmm. um, and then that was followed um, by a Series A and B that uh, brought in a, several other investors, um, which is more David Al Ventures. It's also a Bay Area firm, um, Braemar, which is a New York, New York energy firm, and Altero, which is a local Colorado firm. And to date we've raised tw over $22 million. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So, but the energy, the energy capitalists are giving you money. So they yes, must think yeah. that somewhere in your past, you know, there's energy. Well, I guess there is, no question <laughs> yeah. about it. The acrylics is just a teaser, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, well, I mean, we can do a lot of different products with the technology. We can, yeah. we can optimize microbes to make a lot of different chemicals and or fuel molecules. And as we discussed, we are first going after acrylic as our first chemical product. Scale is a little smaller. The margin is a little, a little higher. Um, and... Um, the, the amount of feedstock you need is more doable. Uh, people have made polylactic acid plants and other chemical process plants. Um, we really took a tact for the fuels, uh, which is our energy play, that traditional sugar feedstocks weren't going to be cost competitive um, to really get into the game to be producing economically competitive fuels. Mm -hmm. And so we started to develop other the use of other feedstocks, such as syngas or renewable hydrogen and CO2, which we feel give us a, a cost advantage on the input side. And so um, we recently, as I said, received some funding to pursue and push that um, product farther ahead. But I think that's where some of the energy interest is in, is in our company, in addition to the chemical um, applications that we're pursuing. Well, I mean, the chemical applications could be really something, too. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's, it sounds, I mean, uh, are there a lot of companies doing what you're doing? doing there are uh, more and more joining the chemicals, uh, um, the, the renewable chemicals uh Group. Are they are they are they startups or are they bigger than that? Are they, you know, offshoots of larger chemical companies? Mm -hmm. yeah. I'd say most of the the effort right now is in a lot of startup companies. Mm -hmm. So um, there are um, a handful of companies that have been started over the last several years that have been focused on fuel products initially that are now turning their attention more toward chemical products. Um, and I think the primary reason for that is that um, they can make more money. Um, <laughs> how about how about Europe and Asia? I mean, are you finding all the competition in the U.S., or or is it happening around the world? Uh, there is definitely competition around the world, especially in this space. I think, in particular, for fuels, are definitely a very global uh, market. But so are these chemicals. I mean, uh, I think the in the acrylic case, about a third of the end use of acrylic is in the U.S., um, but a third is in Asia, and a third is in Europe. Uh, sure, everybody's manufacturing now, especially China. Yeah. <clears throat> They'd be interested to know what you're doing and do it the same way. <laughs> uh, they <laughs> may be. protect your IP. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, you know, it all sounds to me like, I mean, take a wild guess. I'm, I'm, t I'm perfectly non-scientific about this. But the process you learn on building acrylic 
is a, at least a kissing cousin to the process you would use on building fuels. Am I right? Um, actually, there's a lot of overlap. So I think from um, not only from a processing standpoint, how do you um, handle these bacteria and scale the process, but also from a, um, a microbe standpoint. So we actually have chosen paths that leverage what we learn about how to optimize a microorganism for product one and then give us a jumping uh, head start on product two. And so we can leverage a lot of the work we put into acrylic to go after um, uh, biodiesel as well as other products. Make it biodiesel out of, out of sugar beet or some sugar beet sugar or like hydrogen that. CO2. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's pretty exciting. So is your, your process, I take it, is different than any other process you've heard about? Uh, we feel so, yes. I feel so too. I'm <laughs> totally on faith. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, to my knowledge, it's it's uh, unique and it's actually probably um, one of the fastest um, time frames to get to a, the stage that we're at in terms of the, the scale up and the development for a type of renewable chemical. And I think uh, really is going to, going to set the bar in terms of um, generating a cost competitive um, solution. Well, uh, what about what about um, jet fuel? You know, there's uh, some attempts going on here in Honolulu to make, uh, or rather Hawaii in general, to make jet fuel out of, um, out of, um, uh, I can do this, blocking algae. Yes. And um, so, I mean, it, it hasn't really come to pass yet, mm -hmm. but we know the military wants it and DARPA wants it and is willing to put its money where its mouth is. is mm -hmm. Now, is your process going to be similar? To that, uh, is it going to be as effective as what they see happening coming down the pike using algae? Mm -hmm. I think that um, our process for biodiesel, first of all, can be leveraged very quickly to make jet fuel. So we actually have a partner in the uh, DOE program that we've been funded for, Johnson Matthew, which is a catalyst company. And they've actually developed and are developing catalysts to take our um, biodiesel molecules and break them up into jet fuel molecules. So um, it's sort of that upgrading to traditional diesel and jet fuel molecules is another end, end application of the fuel so, that we'll be making. So the trick is, <laughs> hang in there. Sure. <laughs> the trick is, well, better sound. <laughs> the, the trick is um, that, uh, what, that whatever you do um, on one kind of substance, you use that process on the other kind of substance and so your 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 approach would be different than algae, but it would it would reach the same result. So it's sugar beets, uh, sugar beets to a sort of interim kind of uh, material, and mm -hmm. then from there, you will have the technology to make that material into uh, uh, jet fuel. Yes, that's correct. Do you have that now, or are you working on We're that? working on that. It's a three-year uh, program, and by the end of the, the third year, we'll be able to start doing pilot studies for that mm, program. So this, now, that'll be really killer, mm -hmm. you know, if you can do that. And we, you know, the feedstocks that we're using, um, you know, the hydrogen and CO2, obviously, CO2 can come from waste streams. Hydrogen can come from many different sources, so um, gasified biomass, for example. Um, the ARPA program has actually funded us to work on hydrogen um, envisioning that hydrogen can come from electrolysis and solar PV panels. But also gasification of municipal solid waste, for example, is another way to get uh, um, Have you been working, have you been trying on it? Or is this, we this have is just... been using uh, uh, very purified feedstocks in the lab currently, but we have been talking to people who are, have developed technologies to take these other renewable feedstocks and convert them into hydrogen and CO2. So have you talked to the Kings, Bob and Kelly King? No. Oh, well, I should tell you, they're Pacific Biodiesel. From Maui, and they're they're really the biodiesel people in Hawaii. Really interesting. And they they're you know they're a successful commercial company selling biodiesel, um, made with um, animal feedstock, hmm. and uh, they're looking at Trofa now too. Okay. So we should talk to them. Yes, when definitely are you should. Like, I leave tomorrow. Oh, when you but we can back. definitely uh, <laughs> we can there definitely are ways, stay in contact. There are ways. Yeah, we have our <laughs> yeah, it was interesting that uh, at one of the conference today. Um, the uh, Navy was discussing how much uh, demand there was for renewable fuel in Hawaii, and particularly that there was a 100 to 200 million gallons per year required of biodiesel, which was actually pretty interesting to hear. Um, and kind of a captive market being an island. Well, I mean, but the, the Navy, uh, the military, uh, what I understand is they, ha they have committed to mm -hmm. replacing all of their fossil fuel by uh, uh, something like uh, 2016 or 2020. It's not very far away. 
no. and uh, they have the money and they have DARPA to help them and um, you know they're determined to do this and uh, the guy who comes in with the way that you know a way that will create it efficiently in sufficient quality and quantity is the one who gets the brass ring on this mm -hmm. and it's not clear that algae is the way yet I mean mm -hmm. they're still they're still in, in research and uh, nobody associated with algae will tell you that they got it now. Mm -hmm. uh, am I right? They don't, yeah, you know, I, I they're think still it's, working. Yeah. I think algae is a great um, concept, and I think it has a lot of potential. I think the difficulties with algae are how do you scale the systems um, and keep control of them? Mm -hmm. And I think that'll be, when people crack that, it'll be a, a great day for Have you seen an algae farm? Uh, only pictures. It's very interesting. Yeah. There's one on Kauai that is fairly robust. I mean, it's large relative to mm -hmm. research for, and um, it's it's very interesting because they every day the thing doubles in volume mm -hmm. so they pump it into a tank that's twice the size and then it rains and it rains a lot in Kauai by the way ah. so quick got to pump it out of the tank and into a closed <laughs> closed tank because you know you, you need it in the open tank to get the sun ah. but when it rains you got a quick you know, reverse the process, hold it there until the rain stops. This sounds something like a Rube Goldberg cartoon, you know. <laughs> uh, and the thinking being that the rain will contaminate or dilute oh, out. Oh, that's, the, that's more yeah. than thinking. I mean, any, any kind of rain will put something in it. Okay. And then you lose the efficiency, and uh, that's what they're working on, trying to make mm. it efficient. They're trying to get a certain am amount of lipid oil out of a given, you know, volume mm -hmm. of algae. And uh, until they do that, they're stuck. So, uh, you know, is, now is your process all in a closed, in a closed, can, so you don't run into having, you don't need the sun or anything like that? Uh, no, you? it's, it's, it's a closed system um, and more traditional fermentation processing in that sense. Um, I think the, the hydrogen CO2 process is gas fed, um, but that's the only key difference between, say, mm -hmm. a sugar fed uh, fermentation and our fermentation process for the, the fuels. So is this what you talked about today? Actually, we talked about acry acrylic, so... Uh, Let's go back to that. Yeah, sure. We, we, you know, why not? <laughs> so is this acrylic going to be like every other acrylic I know, every single other acrylic I know? Yes, it will be exactly the same as other acrylic, By except way, it will come from renewable feedstock. I saw a thing on PBS yesterday about plastics, old plastics, original plastics, mm -hmm. original plastics, and there was an artist who created objects, you know, art objects from the original plastics. And what's interesting is the original plastics fell apart hmm. and these objects can cannot be restored they're totally wasted huh. and and it, it hasn't been that long you know it must be 50 80 years something like that since the original plastic and so uh, you know you really wonder acrylics would never fall apart right they'll be they'll be good right they last a long time yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think uh, you know the acrylics that we'll make uh, I think they are from renewable feedstocks but they aren't biodegradable um, they are just like any other acrylic in the sense that they will be um, uh, around for a very, very long time. Could I, could I take a piece of a swatch of them uh, or a dab of them and, and know that they're yours and no one else's? Uh, probably not, unless you have some uh, uh, radio-labeled carbon analysis. <laughs> but you could. You, you could. Theoretically. Yeah, theoretically, like yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, it seems to me like you're in a great spot to rule the world on on, uh, on Lowe's and Home Depot. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a limited market in the end, isn't it? Well, you know, our first plant um, won't even take care of um, the, the growth of the market. So, uh, you know, it's an $8 billion a year market, roughly 8 billion pounds. And we're making 100 million pounds per year in our, in our plant. So um, you got a long way to go. We got a long way to go. I um, shouldn't worry then. You shouldn't worry. Um, <laughs> and, it, and it's a growing market of about 4% a year. So if we built a plant every few years, we still wouldn't keep up with the demand. So we have, um, we can be very successful and we don't have to um, supplant the traditional players. Okay. Well, <laughs> you know, all right. I, w I wouldn't worry. Um, <laughs> So do you, do you have adequate uh, intellectual property protection on this sort of thing? I mean, or do you feel that, that, that cheesy feeling of somebody, you know, running after you? Um, are you going to be able to protect this? Uh, we, feel, we feel so, yeah. I think... Uh, what do you got in way of patents? Uh, we have a few patents on the technology platform that have issued, and we have filed uh, over 30 patents in, with respect to the bioacrylic and other projects um, mm -hmm. that are still in prosecution currently. Uh, it's a pretty... Uh, dynamic IP situation out there. A lot of different uh, 
decisions and, and different discussions as to what is now obvious, not obvious, especially in, in the fields of uh, synthetic biology and metabolic engineering. And in particular, in the case of uh, acrylic and 3-HP, um, there's a lot that's been discussed over the last 10 to 15 years. There's been some pretty heavy um, work done by um, uh, Cargill in particular and over the last decade on trying to get this uh, product to commercialization as well. And so there's a lot of IP in the space. We feel our IP is differentiated and uh, protectable and will give us not only the ability to, to make acrylic, license it. but I, we think that our IP really doesn't block that because I think people have done that before. It really blocks the ability to make it cost competitively compared to petroleum. So this is good. You, have, you believe you have an advantage yeah, over anybody else in the field right now. Yeah. Okay, let me shift gears a little bit and, uh, and talk about your education because uh, it's scary. <laughs> <laughs> Try going through it. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Tell me about your CV. Yeah, so um, I uh, um, uh, most recently had an MD PhD, so I was in a research. Why, why did you do that exactly? So when I was in college, uh, I wanted to be an anthropologist to start. So yeah, I actually doesn't everybody. Up, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I really was interested in that, and I thought uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, but I also really enjoyed science, so I did a dual pack tract in um, biomedical engineering and, and anthropology. And I think I didn't want to give up the humanity side of myself when I went to grad school, so I chose an MD-PhD where I could pursue science and some of the uh, softer so sides of life as well. you still hold the possibility of, uh, <laughs> of actually seeing patients and all that? Uh, maybe I'll go back at one point, yeah. I really enjoyed uh, family medicine, so I may, I may one day end up in that From family that medicine to high chemistry, <laughs> all right. <laughs> you never know. Um, well, yeah, you know, just uh, we're working on a show right now about a, 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 a local mission that sends uh, surgeons, you know, all over the all over Asia, yeah. and you could do that. That that I could, would be a I lot of fun. You connect you yeah. up if you have time. Yeah. Well, I don't have time for a while. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it, that would be a lot of fun. I think uh, Doctors Without Borders and uh, yeah, traveling. Really, yeah. yeah. Okay. So then, so what what do you wind up studying? Uh, I know it's all about analytical thinking, and critical thinking. But yeah, what yeah. do you wind up studying in this program that that makes it work for you? Well, um, you know, f there's a pretty traditional uh, engineering um, uh, study that you do, uh, especially for the um, biomedical and the chemical engineering uh, PhD that I did. Um, and in medicine, it's, it's very broad in terms of biology, biochemistry, um, molecular biology, um, human disease. Um, and I think the, the biggest lessons in, in medicine that, that you have to learn are how to talk to people, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, bedside in, manner, in, in any, um, in some any. psychology and psychiatry is pretty important as yeah, well. Yeah, but I mean, you, 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 you talk to the bacteria or what? Oh, we, we don't talk. Well, I don't talk to the bacteria. I'm sure some people may. <laughs> if, if you talk to the bacteria, they're going to they're gonna come for you. Exactly. But, but uh, no, uh, I'm just wondering because, uh, you know, the whole medical thing about saving lives and all that is really not relevant to this at all. Um, no, I know you yeah. may do it at some other time in the world, but, yeah, but for no. now... For now, no, it's it's not really relevant. I think when when I was going to finish my PhD as part of the program, it was it was a big decision to say I was going to turn turn over and, and focus completely on the technology. But um, at that time, we had uh, developed the technology that was the um, some of the founding technology for OPX, and uh, we were getting some serious interest from venture capitalists. And I, um, you know, thought, well, I'll either regret it more if I don't jump at this opportunity, or then I will if I if I let it go by. So. so this deal came out of school for you? I mean, this was something generated, sort of like Mark, uh, Mark uh, Zuckerberg, like that. Yeah, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about that. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a very unfair comparison. How, how cruel of me. <laughs> hey, you know, I, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind that. <laughs> <laughs> You're like the end product. <laughs> um, well, you know, it was uh, probably a three to five year process in terms of uh, developing the technology platform, really thinking of the strategy for the first part so of the So you're company. in school when this happens, and these are your, yeah. your classmates you're talking to. Um, well, it's actually, the other founder was my professor um, for, my, for my engineering pro degree, um, Ryan Gill, who's still at the University of Colorado in the Department of Chemical Engineering. And so um, he had a lot of connections, uh, um, and actually his professorship was, um, was endowed by um, uh, lawyer in the Bay Area named uh, uh, Vern Norville. Is he a, a venture He's capitalist He's an IP person? attorney. Okay. Um, and so he had done a, some assessment of the technology and, and thought we really had something that could offer uh, the field um, some significant um, cost savings and improvement and that we could really turn that into a company. How many years ago are we talking about here? So that, we were founded in 2007, so all this was happening 2005 to 2007. Mm -hmm. 
within the last five years, the yeah. whole thing. Yeah. Okay, so you have these conversations, and he connects you up, or you guys get connected up mm -hmm. with the lawyer in San Francisco. Yep. And uh, that's that's two of you plus the lawyer. Yep. And well, then, now, now what happens? And then, you know, we had a lot of help from the university. So they actually did some um, free legal work, work with the law clinic and the business school. To kind of, IP legal work? Uh, incorporation, some IP assessment, some of the initial filings. So you incorporated while you're in school? Yes. That's terrific. Yeah. I really, I'm so glad we went off on this tack because I want to know more about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, this is uh, University of Colorado. This is University of Colorado, and the tech transfer office was very helpful in terms of introducing us to VCs and helping us um, really understand what kind of pitch we had to have to, to raise money. And um, uh, Vern got us in touch with some of the Bay Area um, venture capitalists as well. That's how we actually ended up um, meeting Michael uh, Boris, who is mm -hmm. the principal at Exceed Capital, and that's where the first seed money came in from. So, so was it, I mean, we were doing really well in school. I mean, we were top of the class and all that. So <laughs> that attracted the professor to you and made the venture capital guy sit up straight and all that. Or, <laughs> or was it personality? I think it is um, mostly personality and trustworthiness. And I think we had a recent publication and a pretty well-regarded uh, academic together, journal together, mm -hmm. which also gives some outside credit to the technology. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you two guys were the founders then, mm -hmm. and he and he became the CEO. Uh, actually, no. We um, we were lucky enough through the venture capitalists um, to get a um, temporary a CEO on board from um, a lot of experience in the pharmaceutical right, industry. Somebody who's been somebody through who's it been before, through yeah. It. And um, he was on board for uh, Rob Chess is his name. He was on board for almost two years as our uh, CEO, um, and he's still on as our. Um, um, on our board. Mm -hmm. And at that time, we had really committed that we were going to be going into um, the chemical space and particularly into uh, bioacrylic. And we were lucky enough to get Chaz Eggert, who is our current CEO um, and president. So you recruited him? From the chemical industry, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and he's a real chemical executive person. Yep. Older. Yes. Okay, well, yeah. executive. Older than me. <laughs> okay, well, all right. That's, that leaves a large field. <laughs> so what, uh, I, what I like about this story, though, is that the university is still there. You're still in the, in the lap of the university. They're helping you. They're nurturing you. Mm -hmm. um, and, I mean, is there is there – I know about New Fitzsimmons. I know about that. Is New Fitzsimmons involved in this? No. Um, this is all through the Boulder campus and the Technology Transfer Office at CU Boulder. So, so Boulder is a distance and it's not... It's one university system, but um, there definitely is a difference between, say, the Fitzsimmon um, bio-incubator that they've set up to do yeah. more pharma startups and where we've been connected through with the Boulder campus. So is it... Now, is it that the, the Boulder campus is a, a high-tech campus? I mean, I really don't know. Is it known nationally to be the kind of campus that generates organizations like yours? I think it's getting more and more recognition for that. I think mm -hmm. CU in general is. I think the medical school keeps going up in rate, ratings and the the, um, the the graduate school associated with medical school as well as the, the Boulder campus. I think Colorado in general is really becoming a sort of a clean tech leader. We have a lot of startups from the industry. The clean tech is only, what, five years yeah. old? I mean, it's... It's, well, it's a little older than that, but okay, there's six. a lot of work in the last, the yeah, last yeah, yeah. Uh, decade or so. And I think it, there's been a long, a large, uh, strong root um, biotech capability, not just with the universities, but also with the, um, the population in and around Boulder. Um, Amgen was started there. There are a few other startups that are in the pharmaceutical industry. Is there a physical campus where they all sort of congregate, or are they spread out? Um, the, the startups are sort of spread out, um, and the campus is ever-growing. Um, so, I mean, really, I ask this because I'm interested in comparing it with Hawaii mm -hmm. and seeing what lessons we can learn from what happened, if you're willing to tell me. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> you know, here we have, here we have uh, okay, I'll give you 10 years. 10 years ago, none of this. Okay. And all of a sudden, over the past 10 years, certain things are put into motion. Yeah. Certain things happen in the schools. Certain things happen, you know, with the tech transfer people. Mm -hmm. and, and the reputation gets gets a little more robust and then you hit critical mass somehow mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you're you're doing good <clears throat> and other companies like yours mm -hmm. I'm sure you're not the only one who's working yeah. with yeah. with the tech transfer people so what what happened what was the process yeah it was um, you know you need to have um, entrepreneurial such as uh, entrepreneurs such as Ryan uh, my advisor who really are on the, the lookout to how do we commercialize this, how do we get an industry involved in the academic uh, research. Um, I think that was critical. I think the other thing that was critical is the university really had a desire to um, 
spin out and get value from that technology. So from the early on, there was um, uh, evaluation and filing of IP, which was critical to getting an investment. Um, like I said, the business school and the law school had programs to help entrepreneurs. Well, they were actively involved. Actively involved to help start up companies free, and do free business legal models. Service, free what by students. Free and all by that, but it's students. not rocket science to make a corporation. You know, sorry I said that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but a lot of help. Uh, there's also um, a couple integrated programs at the University of Colorado that really kind of help get the people from the university with these types of technologies in touch with local venture capital communities. Um, and uh, angel investors and, and the the financial uh, angel investors in Boulder. Mm -hmm. Did you find locally what, what, when we talk about angel investors in Boulder? What are we talking about? Fifty thousand, seventy five. Uh, there, the angel investors in Boulder are probably a, the hundred thousand range. Hundred thousand. Yeah. We didn't. We didn't. Get any you didn't use them. You angel, didn't need them. You were okay in the garage or whatever. We, we were okay with the with the um, initial funding from the Bay Area VC firm. So okay, okay, that's where it started. That's where it started, yeah. <laughs> where okay. it started yeah. So, I mean, this is quite amazing uh, because, say, 10, 15 years ago, the university was not known for this sort of thing. But is the university known for, you know, uh, expertise in things chemical and chemistry? Mm -hmm. Is it known for this, this kind of... Uh, you know, research, the kind of research that you've been doing, or is this something that's happened recently? I think it's a pretty recent, uh, the metabolic engineering aspect of CU is pretty recent. I think uh, um, Professor Gill was one of the first uh, um, people to come on to the Department of Chemical Engineering as a metabolic engineer. And so I think that has been a growing effort um, at, at CU. So it sounds like, you know, just a few committed people can actually change the way a community works. Oh, I would agree with that, yeah. yeah. But I think the CU had a lot of uh, history with um, some other key startups as well in the pharma industry. So they had had some success in how do we get these people in touch with financing and then they've reaped the benefits of successful companies. So I think they were very open to um, people being um, willing to do this. So how about your company, uh, Ox OxyBio? Um, is that well known? I mean, if I walked down the street in Boulder and called out your name, would everybody know who I was talking about? <laughs> well, I think uh, you guys yeah. local heroes. You know, maybe you should be. Uh, OPX, I think, is uh, OPX. I'm yeah, sorry. yeah, that's okay. It's uh, probably getting to be more known in Boulder and in, in Colorado and Denver. I think uh, I think three years ago or two years ago, or even a year ago, if you would have asked people, you probably would have gotten a very different segment, not knowing anything about us. I think more recently, people probably have heard more about OPX, and we've done some um, um, work to kind of get our name out and to be more recognized. I remember uh, a guy named uh, um, Olson, Robert Olson, was the guy who ran New Fitzsimmons. He created mm -hmm. New Fitzsimmons, um, which was quite a story all by itself. And and I, I asked him, uh, you know, what what was the magic that that you know created this whole pharma community, this mm -hmm. critical mass. And New Fitzsimmons, and he said it was breakfast. I said, really? Really? Breakfast. So what is that about? He says, well, what researchers like to do more than anything is, is talk to other researchers. They <laughs> like to share their work, you know, because they can't talk to their wives about it, you know, <laughs> unless their wives are other researchers. Yeah. Um, so what he did was he set up these humongous you know, breakfasts once a week, and he invited everybody down from all the companies, and you know they put they put an understanding on it. You know we're not we're not here to rip anyone off. You know yeah. we, we want you guys to play nice, and um, and they would come and present their work. You know and and as a result, huge numbers of people came down because they were you know they figured they learned something, mm -hmm. um, and that was the kernel. You know the magic bullet that made New Fitzsimmons draw all these pharma companies and be what it is today, which I guess it's quite something, I guess. Yes, it's quite a, it's quite a, quite a place. So what about, what about you guys? Um, do you, do you get out? I mean, aside, aside, aside from this, this trip here. <laughs> yes. Um, we do. I mean, you know, as a startup, we've, we've definitely tried to play it, co um, very careful about what we present, where we are in terms of, uh, um, staging our, our development that's in the public eye but we do we, we we've attended conferences in the next year we're, we're going to be attending more and more conferences uh, probably in the next period of time being a little more open about where we are and the successes we've had um, especially as we um, start moving toward our demonstration um, and I think but we do get out I think more than a lot of people and I think it, it is as you said it's important not only to present what we're doing 
but to really learn about what's going on in the space, um, keep current. And, um, and the community, I think, in the renewable chemicals and fuels is very supportive. I mean, there's definitely a healthy competition going on, but I think everybody knows that if um, for the industry to succeed, we all need to be successful. Sure. And so and it is it's a, very supportive. It's a new industry driven mm -hmm. by new considerations. So uh, here you are, and it sounds like you're in a pretty good place. I mean, you're, you're out, and you're talking to a group here. You talk to other groups. Uh, they know who you are. You're recognized, and you're on, on, on the verge. You know, the capital. You have what you need. You have the people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of these days, it's going to pop right through, and there it's going to be fantastic. Yep. Okay, so how do you deal with that? I mean, is this... Is this something, and if you don't want to talk to me about it, that's okay. My <laughs> no, job is mind. to get you to say, I, I prefer not to discuss that. <laughs> but, but, you know, how do you see this unfolding for you as the chief, chief science officer? Mm -hmm. um, you could be on, on a, you know, a gold mine right now. But then, you know, how do you look at it? Do you look at it, well, I'll be here forever. Mm -hmm. Or do you look at it, well, I, you know, they're going to acquire, somebody is going to come around and mm -hmm. acquire us and do this fantastic deal with us. And A, we're going to be rich, but B, we're going to be with a big company, which, mm -hmm. you know, what's, what do you, how do you see that? How do I see it? Well, that's a, a tough question, I have to say. Um, <laughs> you don't have to answer it. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it, it is, um, you know, we are building a, a sustainable business. I mean, that's, that's the goal. And I think it, Three years ago, we probably weren't expecting to be um, where we are today, meaning, you know, when we first started with the first round of money, we were going to be 10 people for a few years, and now we're 50 in three years. So it's... But what um, happened to change that? Well, I think we had a lot of early technical success, and we also realized that if we really wanted to start um, pushing and competing and being commercially relevant in the time frame we needed to, yeah. we needed to build faster than maybe we originally had planned. Yeah, and you um, did. And we did. You and worked hard. Yeah. In the middle of the night, you worked. You worked yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of people at OPX have, have worked many nights and weekends, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's been a lot of fun, too. I think, uh, you know, every six months is a, is a very different change in, in, in the company in terms of what you do, in terms of the group. I mean, it's always dynamic and changing, so it's very interesting that way. I think uh, you're right. You know, it, we're now getting to the point where I think for the first product in particular, it is becoming a lot bigger than than us. We were looking for partners, so our business strategy is actually to commercialize acrylic, not by ourselves, but in a joint venture with um, an industrial partner. Mm -hmm. Help us with the capital and also help us with the development and the, and the management of the process. And so um, that's isn't, a definite- that an intimidating kind of, you know, because those guys will have law firms with 2,000 people, right? <laughs> and who are used to skinning cats alive kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. So, uh, you know, how do you feel about that? Would you go into that negotiating room? How would you how would you feel comfortable about that? Get into a deal like that where everything is on the line like that? What do you think? Well, I think, you know, um, we have a really you're great... You're not intimidated, I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> we have a really great team. So we have a, a really experienced uh, CEO, um, um, VP of Business Development, CFO, and a, a VP of Engineering who's done process development of bioprocesses for the last 20 years. So I think... Um, I'm more confident in that team being able to really um, play at that table with these partners and really get the best deal that we can. That's what it's about. And that's what it's about. Yeah. And I think moving forward, we have, um, you know, only to look forward to, I think, the success of this product. And I think, you know, what happens in terms of the company being acquired or, or, um, or the exits, I think, is probably within the next five-year time frame. But... Who knows? And so you, you, well, I guess that's really the yeah. answer to my question. Who knows? You got to be flexible in this. Exactly. <laughs> and it, you may have one thing in your mind. You know, you're ideating yeah. one set of, uh, you know, circumstances, but yeah. it could be something else. Mm -hmm. So you could be here. You could be there. Every day is a new day. Yeah, that's very true. <laughs> and it's and it's exciting for that reason. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. It is. But how can you handle all that excitement? I mean. It's <laughs> 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 yeah. uh. So, I mean, so clearly uh, you're not going back to archaeology. We get that? <laughs> no, <laughs> that's, not, that's not, not going to be going back to anthropology, no. <laughs> uh, uh, anthropology, uh, yeah, sorry. That's fine. <laughs> is there a difference? <laughs> yes, that, yes. Archaeology is a part of anthropology, yeah. yeah true yeah. anthropology. Yeah. So um, the, the other thing is uh, query whether you're on a track um, as a scientist and a mm -hmm. researcher, or this, this all leads to, you know, uh, the chief operating officer or the, uh, you know, the, the CEO, mm -hmm. um, is it, how do you feel about that? Or is it too early to actually get a handle on that? I think it's, it's maybe a little too early to get a handle on that, but I think that is something that, you know, you have to, I personally have to keep 
you know, keep in mind. I mean, you, you go down paths in life and you end up maybe not where you originally started. But I think, um, you know, there definitely is a more technical track and there's more a managerial track. And right now, I, I think I have a, uh, the best of both worlds in some sense. Um, and it may not be the case forever. Um, and so I don't think it's a critical decision for me to make current right now. But uh, I'm also one that I, I think, you know, I'm not afraid to make changes, so, you know, I may go back to medicine one day, so. <laughs> okay, well, and we'll say we knew you, and maybe you'll even say hi then. <laughs> yeah, exactly, I'll, I definitely will. <laughs> so, you know, let's talk about the country for a minute, you know, because mm -hmm. it's, it's a story is a good story, I mean, mm -hmm. for Hawaii anyway. Um, and I wonder, uh, you know, what you, you know, a lot of people say, oh, this country is losing it. Mm -hmm. You know, we're losing all our talent, our expertise to Asia. And we can, we're not as creative. We used to be very creative, but we're not mm -hmm. so creative anymore. And now they picked up on the meaning and the value of creativity, so they're creative. Mm -hmm. And um, you're in the middle of it, so I want to know how you feel about that. How is this country doing? Yeah, I think um, there's definitely a lot of challenges. I think it's still a very creative um, group, at least the people that I, that I spend most time with. I think um, to increase that, I think education is a, is a big thing. I think we probably don't spend enough effort educating through the different levels of education to really get the type of people that we need um, um, to really build these industries. But having said that, I think there there is a growing talent base, and we are you know it takes time to adapt to any of these fields. And I think uh, there are new programs starting up in terms of um, training for um, you know solar industry or wind industry or, or um, um, biofuels industry. And I think it's a matter of time before those um, scientist positions and, and the positions that are needed to really commercialize this industry are just being filled by the right training programs. So do you see trends? What, what trends do you see? I mean, trends, say, following your own trajectory here. Mm -hmm. uh, are the kids behind you um, getting better at this or losing ground on it? Um, and finally, what advice would you give them? Yeah, I think... Uh, um, it's it's a difficult question. I think the the education and where people are now, I think, tends to be um, either too general or too specific. Meaning, you know, and, and I'm not a good one to talk. You know, that I I've done a lot of different from things. From your vantage, <laughs> but from my vantage point, I think um, there's a lot of specialization that may not be needed. And and if you don't go to a two specialty, so if you do a PhD program, you end up being very very specialized. And if you don't do a higher education, you may not have enough training to be able to enter some of these fields. And I think perhaps a better intermediate um, um, early training would be good. Because there's still so much on the job training, which is also fine, a fine way to learn. So if you had to change, I mean, from where you are now, if you had the chance to change what you what you took in school, I mean, your choices mm -hmm. you made on education, would you would you make any changes? Yeah. Uh... I don't think so. I think I, I really have uh, learned a lot from all the different experiences, and I think uh, it, it was a lot of fun. So, um, looking back in that sense, well, those degrees <laughs> were a lot of fun. Which degree was the most fun? <laughs> Maybe there's some degree you haven't told us about. <laughs> no, I think uh, you know. I mean, uh, medical school was a lot of fun. I think it definitely had its its hard times, but I think uh, you learn a lot, and you learn a lot about yourself, which is another good thing to do. I think uh, um, the scientific degree is the same way, uh, different aspects. Um, and I think uh, it was a good balance for me, um, to also giving me time to figure out what I wanted to do, um, which I still don't know, but maybe I'm getting better at deciding. Was there anybody in your family that was pointing you in one direction or another? Or another? Yeah, I think my parents weren't really too happy with the anthropology uh, focus <laughs> early on. <laughs> <laughs> because it was a gut course, no? <laughs> I mean, compared to medicine. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think that's true. I think what killed it for me was the nine-year program you had to do out overseas to, to, to really pursue that type of... Uh, um, well. Career. It's, it's not too late to join uh, Aloha Medical Mission. <laughs> That's, <laughs> true. That's so, true. So what about, now what about, um, you know, uh, kids in school, um, what should they do? What, what is your advice to them in general to, you know, make this country more science, more engineering, and able to compete in, a, in an increasingly competitive world? What, what would you say to the, the school districts in, uh, in Colorado mm -hmm. or elsewhere? Yeah, I think, you know, the the basic fundamentals, I think, are um, something to really get to know, meaning, you know, it's it maybe more interesting to science. science and math in particular and engineering. 
and really, if you get a, if you really understand the core understanding of how to apply those basic principles, you can really apply and leverage that knowledge to a lot of different applications. And I think that being well rounded in the in the basic principles of science is something to really pursue if you're interested in science. I think the other thing I would say, especially um, people coming out of um, uh, college in particular, really know yourself. What do you really want to do? What are you really good at? Um, I think there's a lot of pressure to compete in an academic sense. Um, and I think people find themselves in tracks um, that are defined by someone else. Someone else. And I think if you really find what you're good at and what you want to do, do, um, it. do it, and I think everything else will work out. Sure. <laughs> no, I know that, that's really that's the that's the point of all of this. Yeah. Be happy. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, so now I want to ask you about Hawaii. We have a few minutes left. To sure. Ask about Hawaii. So, this first trip. Yes, first trip. Okay. Yeah. Impressions. Uh, very beautiful. Um, I think Honolulu is a, uh, a lot more um, dense than I had anticipated. Mm. So, um, but otherwise, I think it's. Uh, I'm, I'm jealous of the weather. <laughs> I could show you days when you wouldn't be jealous. Maybe about a week ago, yeah. <laughs> um, and I think also the thing that has impressed me, um, you know, uh, taking a cab right here, it was 40 minutes to go, a five minute trip, but there was no honking. There was no, true, you yeah. know, it was a very civil, happy, um, laid back group of people. Um, and I think that was probably the most impressive. A lot of places you go in the world are not, not like that. I wrote, a, yeah. I wrote a, a blog the other day and I said, uh, the people in Hawaii are so patient sitting there in traffic, you know, is the Zen capital of the world. You know? <laughs> it did seem like that, the Zen <laughs> capital. <laughs> So, you know, we, we tried, you know, to do, we, we started out with uh, uh, information technology around mm -hmm. the year 2000. There's a lot of uh, action there. And, and a lot of our kids came back that mm -hmm. year and they were looking. It didn't work out. We, didn't, we don't have a really robust information technology community. Mm -hmm. And then we went to life sciences, then called life sciences. Mm -hmm. And we try to, you know, surround the medical school with a whole campus of uh, pharma and all that. And that, that really didn't go anywhere. There was a lot of talk, but uh, at the mm -hmm. end of the day, the only one building that's going up is the Cancer Research Center, which is actually part of the university anyway, so it's just a construction mm -hmm. project. It's not, doesn't mean the world has changed. Mm -hmm. um, and then we got into energy because everybody got into energy, you know, and, and energy, uh, at least at your level, energy is, is tech for sure. It's mm -hmm. science. Yeah. But, but at a level where you, we have the natural resources mm -hmm. that we can, you know, put windmills up and they'll really generate some power. Um, it's not so much tech as it is application of tech, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and at the end of the day, you have to write your check back to somebody on the mainland because yeah. we're not really generating IP here about that. Mm -hmm. So what's your advice to Hawaii? I know mm -hmm. you've had what a few days on the ground, <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and if you don't want to answer, it's okay. No. Yeah. I think, uh, being at the conference, particularly the last few days, there's been a lot of uh, discussion of a why. And I think um, it, it really surprised me, and, and it makes complete sense, and maybe just being from um, the mainland, you don't get the, you know, the, the context, that being an, an island economy is very different than what we talk about. And I think it's a struggle. I, I, I'm getting that it's a very specific struggle um, when you're talking about energy, which is a, and fuel in particular, which is a globally traded um, commodity. and, and what resources can Hawaii leverage um, to be self-sufficient? I think, it, and that is really what I would say is a is a is a key path forward. Um, exporting energy is probably not something that uh, is very feasible, depending on the level. Hydrogen, maybe, yeah, maybe. Yeah. You know, if hydrogen yeah. takes off, I don't yeah. think it has yet. But if yeah. it ever does, you can see ships full of canisters yeah. of hydrogen. Yeah. yeah. And I think technology is also something that, uh, you know, anyone can, can create technology, but I think it's, it's understanding how does that fit in and how do you make the ties to where um, uh, the need is. So if it's uh, the energy economy that, that you want to get technology to drive in, what, what unique advantage is there of um, Hawaii or the, the um, mindset of being in Hawaii? And how do you leverage that to tackle big problems that you may care about in Hawaii but elsewhere? I think in particular the... Uh, the uh, um, Department of Defense programs and those type of uh, programs that are that seem to be centered around around well, Hawaii for the moment, yeah, are are really key and a big step up. And so leveraging that to the, the maximum, like the whole thing with uh, jet fuel and all yeah. that, that's happening for sure. Yeah. 
So, uh, gee, I mean, you have been, you have been, so this discussion at this conference about that, formal discussion or just I think hallway lot, discussion? I hallway discussion and some of the discussions in, in the questions people ask. Mm. You know, how, does, how does this apply to Hawaii? How do we get the fuel that we need? How do we um, uh, generate the energy we need? And how do we become something in this space? So do you think that Hawaii could have research companies like your company operating here? Yeah. I mean, but from what you know of it. Yeah. I mean, I think we, we uh, as OPX, you know, we've done cost models on where we put our first plants, uh, and they're in the central U.S. or, you know, other, other places. But we realize that, you know, for acrylic in particular, it's a global uh, market, and the demand is where the demand is, and so we're going to have to play globally in terms of where the, the actual plants may be for the technology. But um, the technology and the R&D um, definitely can be in Boulder, even though we're never going to build a plant more than likely in Boulder, um, possible, but unlikely because it's not too close to the feedstock and not too close to the customer. Human capital is another important thing to, to build up. I mean, I think if you have, um, if you look at where a lot of people that um, you want to hire into companies like ours um, that may be newly trained, I mean, there's a lot of people that we, we recruit from, from within the industry that experience, you know, there seems to be a, a highly um, big split in the country from the East Coast educational institutions and the West Coast Bay Area institutions. And we have a developing um, corridor in, in Denver that, that supplies a lot of uh, people for OPX in particular. But I think that... You take, you take your people from Denver then? We take our people from Denver. We've taken people from um, California. We've taken people from other places as well. Not so much in New York and East Coast? Not so much. Yeah. yeah. Uh, more from farther west. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, that that actually has a huge impact. I think, you know, it's, it's uh, if you have, you have a great location. I think, you know, Boulder is not a bad location. That's one of the no, reasons why we, we stayed there. Yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> but I think uh, human, human capital is extremely important. Um, and I think the other thing that would really uh, make a difference for startups is really having the financing capital. Um, you know, we were lucky enough to have um, investments. You have your own venture capital yeah. community there, mm -hmm. although San Francisco is yeah. going to be bigger. Yeah. Well, that's probably what we need to do. I mean, early on in this in this progression, yeah. to make sure that Hawaii companies can get venture capital. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that is, is critical for you. Very critical. So, how can we learn more about you? You must have a website. We do have a website. It's uh, www.opxbio.com. Why am I not surprised? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Aloha. <laughs>